we've uh, come a long way in 25 years. The first uh, surgical society that I addressed on the SIJ, I was told, you guys need to stop saying that that joint moves. And uh, I've learned to be a little bit more diplomatic and perhaps my wife will be happy to hear, humble, <laughs> since then. But my answer to that was, do you believe that the lumbosacral facet is a putative pain generator? To which they replied, yes. And I said, well, then how much does the lumbosacral facet move? I believe it's two to three degrees beyond which we'll have osteochondral deformation and fracture. I ask you to permit me to frame part of this discussion in mechanical, electromechanical, electrochemical, or neurophysiological terms. We're going to review the differential diagnosis and diagnostic criteria, include some important subsets discuss the role of image-guided injections, and delineate the relationship between the SIJ and sciatica. Most of this information can be found on our research website. Now our focus is on SIJ-mediated pain, but as Dr. Kitchell pointed out, there are a number of other clinical entities which share confluent sclerotomal referral zones. Here's our SIJ pain map. Note the remarkable overlap with the acetabulofemoral joint, which would include both CAM and pincer type impingement syndromes, or perhaps AVN, the piriformis, and the lower uh, lumbosacral facets. Speaking of detective work, these are the three main elements of our detective workup. Let's break these down. If a patient presents with primary buttock pain or they point to the joint as the source of their pain, consider SIJ dysfunction. I submit this 1,500-year-old skeleton as prima facie evidence that SIJ dysfunction has existed for at least 1,500 years. What the professor of anthropology is pointing out is right-sided degenerative ankylosis. We can agree that unilateral degenerative ankylosis does not occur absent asymmetric loading to failure. Fast forward to one of our patients. Everything old is new again. Coronal CT of the sacrum and sacroiliac joints. You see complete degenerative ankylosis on the right, while the left joint is widely patent. Complete degenerative ankylosis, left joint wide open. 25 years ago, conventional wisdom held fast that the sacroiliac joint was not a putative pain generator. So we sought to answer this question. To that end, we experimentally stimulated the capsules of asymptomatic volunteers. All subjects referred pain below their PSIS with some coursing out toward the greater trochanter. A follow-up study we did with our colleagues at the University of Zurich, specifically Dr. Rudy Kissling, revealed a striking similarity between the pain maps and the innervation. Cadaveric section, note the lateral sacral branches and their interconnecting loops concentrated below the PSIS. Same thing schematically, again, densely concentrated below the PSIS with some twigs coursing out toward the greater trochanter. 
So we know there are a number of physical examination stress maneuvers, right? We also know if we combine more than one of those, we increase the diagnostic yield provided we standardize. Allow me to make this easy for you by sharing my favorite five. Again, buttock pain as a primary pr presentation. Sacral sulcus and joint line pain. Tenderness over the pubic symphysis. Why pubic symphysis? The pelvic girdle is a ring. Remember Pascal's principle? Yeah, physics is like getting into a wet bathing suit, right? Fort and finger test, we'll get to that. And a history of perceived instability. Or, doctor, I stepped off a curb and I felt it go out, right? No surprise that the SIJ would be very sensitive to changes in position and pressure as our lab found an abundance of these in the capsule. This is a 130 micron in diameter Piscinian corpuscle. Again, palpate the surrounding ligaments. If the patient, upon being asked where their pain is emanating from, points immediately medial and inferior to the PSIS, you can take it to the bank. Radiographically, Fortin finger test, overlies the joint. I like to combine it with the Patrick's maneuver. Place the patient in this position, ask them to close their eyes and take a mental image of where the pain is emanating from. And then once they have the image, ask them to turn on their side and point to where the pain is coming from. Again, medial and inferior to the PSIS. There are a number of other important diagnostic subsets to consider when you're working a patient up for SIJ dysfunction. If you're interested in their individual imaging findings, I refer you to our imaging chapter. Let's talk about a few of these. Our friend Jim Miller at the University of Michigan demonstrated that the SIJ is actually 20 times 20 times more vulnerable to axial loading to failure than the lumbar motion segments. Commensurate with Jim's work, we found a high incidence of SIJ pain in competitive figure skaters who constantly land their jumps on the same lower extremity. So we have an axial load transmitted along the bicondylar axis of the femur to the innominate, creating tremendous shear across the SIJ. We know there's an increased incidence after lumbar fusion. Another study we did with our friends at the University of Zurich, again, buttock pain is a primary presentation. So, transaxial CT, a little quiz, transaxial CT, level of S2, here's your hint, soft tissue window settings. What's missing? Ding, 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 ding. The right piriformis, okay? So muscle imbalance may lead to SIJ dysfunction. Likewise, congenital anomalies can create asymmetric loading. And so what we have here from the paper that in which we describe the frequency of these is the posterior accessory joint. And by the way, bilaterally, these can be obstructionistic when you're attempting to cannulate the true synovial portion of the joint. Same thing at S3. If a patient presents with sciatica, radicular symptoms, that does not exclude the SIJ. Our lab found three pathways between the SIJ and major neural elements. 
oblique arthrography, anterior inferior aspect of the capsule, sharply demarcated by contrast, is interrupted by this large ventral rent. Same patient, transaxial CT, level of S1, contrast escaped, extravasated, remote to the needle in the presacral space, surrounding L5 in the plexus. Next, we assayed symptomatic ligaments harvested at the time of surgery for substance P. Purple dots, substance P. And here you see it within a neuro neurofilament. Hence, noxious chemical mediators can extravasate from a symptomatic joint, perhaps causing radicular symptoms. Image-guided injections do not obviate the need for careful history and physical because they have their own pitfalls, right? Some of you may not recognize me with a mustache. <laughs> I, I get a bang out of this. I've been showing it forever, but I, I do this for me because I think humans are such fascinating creatures. Uh, you know, the body language, for example. The, you know, the patient, he looks like he's preparing for a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> and my God, the doctor looks like he's based in a turkey. It, it turns out this is Pierre Forestier. He actually um, is important in this discussion because he pioneered the use of gold and the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, as well as applications for epidurography and myelography. For image-guided injections, we employ a posterior inferior approach because the caudal limb of the joint is most accessible. We look for a lucent window. Notice how the needle takes a characteristic bend as it conforms to the interdigitating contours of the joint. AP arthrogram, bead of contrast, within the joint margin, characteristic coin-shaped inferior recess. Why do joints have recesses? Because they move. There are redundant areas in the capsule to allow for motion. The oblique arthrogram reveals the auricular shape of the diarthrodial joint and lateral arthrography. And you can see there you get kind of a confluence of overlying densities. Finally, a reminder. A structurally abnormal disc, a structurally abnormal rotator cuff, a structurally abnormal meniscus, and yes, a structurally abnormal SIJ on CT or MRI doesn't even tell us if the patient is alive or dead, let alone what's causing their symptoms. You with me? In summary, image-guided injections should simply be an extension of a careful history and physical. Consider contributing factors, spondyloarthropathies, muscle imbalance, congenital anomalies, and finally, don't forget the SIJ is a putative cause of sciatica. Thank you very much.